Okay, so we're here, basement door, very, very privileged um, to have uh, an old friend of mine on, um, slightly older than me, not much. Um, yeah. <laughs> please Hello. welcome Mr. Dave. Hello, Hello. Dave. <laughs> Hello, Dave, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm fine. Um, still hold up here, dying to get out. <laughs> and um, but anyway, keeping sane, still making music. And doing stuff, so it's fine. Yeah, you know, yeah. still doing all that. So we've yeah. we've known each other for a few years um, now, um, you know, through various means and stuff. And, yeah. Um, and you've been you've been great in sort of like you know helping me with a few bits and pieces. I remember you did. I don't know when it was now. It was a yeah. you did a workshop for us, which was very helpful for some of the people that came down about the music industry and how to how to generate yeah. income. I think wasn't it. Yes, it was generally how how to make income from from the internet, and we talked a little bit in detail. I thought it was better because it wasn't a huge gathering, so it was in fact it was quite useful for everyone in that sense. I think that they could learn a little bit more about um, the royalty rates that you get on um, places like Spotify and mm. iTunes, and what the advantages are. And how the music business has changed, and it has radically changed now. Unfortunately, um, a lot of people saying it's definitely controlled by uh, record companies now. The so streaming is owned by um, Warner's and Universal and Sony. So uh, it's 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 not it's not as good as it should be. There should be a lot more freedom. But there are quite a few independent uh, distributors. So it's not, you know, uh, like CD Baby, Disco Kid, and smaller distribute, you know, that you can use yeah. that to help smaller. Because well, really, what we were talking about were the up and coming bands and up and coming talents within uh, the, the scene here in the borough of mm. Richmond, which is which I thought was really some of the some of the things we saw were really good and that that seminar I just I think we talked quite on quite a lot of subjects on management and what mm. a management commission those sort of things and what an agency would take just the basics really I think mm. and an approximate on how a track is marketed now mainly via by viral marketing and those sort of things yeah yeah it's, it's, uh, it, i found it very interesting yeah. and I, I think some of the stuff you talked about about the um the way that things have changed in the 1950s with it going from the publishers to the bands could actually produce their own records uh, um, yeah i think that that that's really very significant in the sense because if you really understand the history of it, where the music business effectively started in Denmark Street, just off Charing Cross Road, where all the songwriters came up with their songs to the publisher who sat there with their pianos on companies like uh, mm -hmm. Francis Day and Hunter, Noel Gay, KPM, the old publishers and uh, chapels, of course. And they just came in and just played a song on the piano and the guy played the song and they just hummed the tune and they gave him about 20 quid and they took the whole copyright. That means wow. the 8.5%, the 8.5% you get on the publishing, the mechanicals. Mechanicals is the money you get from the sale of a track, i.e. on a record, on a CD, a record or on a download. And you get that sort of percentage that's a percentage for the songwriting yeah so the publisher just took the lot <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> so oh, times, yeah. times have definitely improved for the songwriters from those days definitely yeah, yeah. and i think yeah. we've gone through a period yeah. of like i think up up until recently with the, in, the the sort of advent of the online streaming up until that point from that from that sort of um, publishers making everything until this point of the online stuff there was a really good <clears throat> um it sounds like a really good foundation for people to make money out of music whereas now it's sort of it's a bit, i think it's a bit harder now isn't it unless you unless you really hit it viral it's it's quite hard to sort of make enough money from it yeah well the point is the ro royalty rates that the artists are getting from i.e spotify itunes 
YouTube and all these things, I think are disastrously low for the artists. Mm. And so it's, unless you're a major artist, you're not going to make an awful lot of money. So it's a chicken and egg thing here. And I'm not very happy about it. I don't think mm. it's very helpful. No. But um, what I do want, um, I think there's, there's going to be a lot more activity in trying to get better royalty rates for the artists. Um, uh, the record mm. companies and, uh, and the search engines have been doing pretty well out of all of this. And I think I think that's going to have to be addressed because we, we are, we, we're not seeing enough new artists being thrown up that's mm. the trouble and uh, is it does it allow for creativity in the, um, is it going to be just dominated by tv shows uh with mm. with a few select singer song songwriter uh producers it almost has gone back as i think we were talking about in that seminar we were talking about how uh, the 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 artists in the old days, they were just given the songs and they performed like actors, in fact. Mm. The, but, you know, it all changed with the Beatles anyway. They came yeah. and wrote their own songs and then they sat their own label and they made a success of everything they did. Yeah. And that, that changed everything early. <laughs> then. It's a major change. So we're sort in a way, we've gone back to the sort of 50s again where not so many people, I mean, Ed Sheeran was writing great songs. Yeah, mm. great song I, I, it's good. Yeah, there's a few out there, isn't there? But like but say, I think it's that, it quite a lot. It's, that, it's that selective. It's like who's choosing these performers to get there. And it, it is the record companies that are selecting. So the, the, the sort of the, the multitude, I mean, we've got over 200 artists on our roster and everything, you know, it's like how many of those are actually yeah. going to make it? It's, you know, but there's, there's so much talent out there. Um, and you know, how are they going to make it? I remember, I remember sort of back in the sort of, um, sort of late 70s, early 80s, there was new bands all the time and you could go down the record shop and discover a new band, you know. I remember my friend um, Ian Gray, uh, if you're watching Ian, hi, it's been a very long time. Um, he basically um, wore a, a jacket, a leather jacket with Adam and the Ants written on the back. We'd never heard of Adam and the Ants. It's like, who, who's Adam and the Ants? It's like, you know, but then all of a sudden they, yeah. they're on top of the pops. And about three or four weeks later, they're on top of the pops. And we think it's not, but... He found their record and played it and and you know in the shop it was fantastic and you could do that you could go into a record shop and pick out something and just listen to it and go like you know and the next thing it, it may they may make it or not but it's like the records were in the shops you know which was which was different yeah um, to now um which leads it, me on to it, sort of like which leads me on to sort of like your your musical history in the record industry itself um, we'll go on to mm. your, your musical talents later on, but <laughs> but your so you you who did you work for? Um, do you want to tell us a bit about who you worked for and and the bands you sort of looked after? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Well, it all started when uh, I, I decided to uh, jump ship, and I didn't want to play in bands anymore. I had enough, and um, I had a choice: so either becoming a go and study teaching. Uh, and art and stuff um, and I had a year's sabbatical and I just applied for a job to a few record companies and EMI publishing wanted to see me and they offered me a job and they put me in this uh, very tiny office tiny office in Denmark Street which mm. we were talking about and um, it was pretty old-fashioned there was two guys there with grand pianos and there was something like relics from the past of Leslie Osborne and only Ponticelli. Wonderful, wonderful people. I mean, mm. Leslie Osborne, he uh, he actually played the piano parts uh, to with Lionel Bart for the things like Oliver and all those sort wow. of things. And yeah. it this all took place in that very room I was in. So I oh, felt wow. quite amazed with all that. <laughs> that was great. Uh, and then uh, I was they had catalogues like Gold Forever. American catalogs, KPN had a lot of country and western music. Hell of a lot of country and western music. Mm. And um, I was given the task. I had to bring my own tape recorder. I didn't even have a tape recorder from <laughs> in the United States. So I had to bring my own tape recorder and listen to a thousand songs, literally, wow. for six months. And Peter Phillips, the boss, used to walk down the corridor and say, hits, 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 hits. Uh, that's what we want. And that's what I had to find. That was my job. 
Wow. And I really on come tape. out sort of rock. <laughs> yeah, I fell a prog rock band as I'd been and everything. So I was a little bit, I wasn't exactly uh, the Mickey most of Mr. Pop fantastic in those days. I didn't know much about pop songs. So it wasn't easy, but luckily I picked one or two songs mm. to prove my worth uh, and prove that I could actually pick a hit song. So I survived that. Can you and, tell us uh, which, which ones day. they were? You remember? God, it was a Gold Forever song. Sit me up. Um, no. <laughs> it's too long ago. Okay. I could tell it now. You, now you're throwing that one at me. I will try and remember them because I can remember. It. I can sort of remember them. Yeah, yeah. they were because it, it meant a lot. It saved my job. Yeah, it saved my job. There was a Gold Forever titles. I could remember if I looked up Gold Forever. I, I remember those songs and a couple, yeah. but that proved that I at least had some sort of EFU music yeah. or songs, as they say. Yeah, yeah. But then after that, um, I um, they all thought I was, uh, you know, they, they were more interested in the catalogues and what the catalogues were doing. I mean, publishers don't work very hard. They just more keep an eye on things and make sure it's all going well. Mm. But anyway, my job was to find a hit act. And luckily that I made friends with a guy at EMI Records because I was in publishing and we heard this band called Mr. Big. And... Um, Mm. There was a song on it called Romeo, which I thought was a hit. So I persuaded everyone then that we should sign them. And um, they were really good and I didn't be there too long. And the, the track went straight to top five. Wow. And it's just at that time, KPM were amalgamating back because it just been bought up by EMI, Feldman's, KPM, all these old publishers made fortunes and rather old fashioned living on these catalogs, you see. Mm. So this was a revelation, and I got promoted very rapidly to running the UK side for EMI Publishing. Wow. So that was fantastic for me. That was really good. It was a bit of luck, really. Mm. And um, so did a lot of admin after that. In those days, <laughs> every song, every song that was bought in by right, I had to write out the date it was written, how long it was, and they were called confirmatory assignments, and it was me and the secretary was a long. So I did a, several years of hard administration. And that was hard, mm. and um, and then things were looking pretty dull. I was listening to people that EMI they had Pilot Queen, and that was about it. And then uh, a friend of mine, Chris Salovich, came along and said, "Look, I don't know, I haven't seen them, but there's a word out. Go and check out this band, the Sex Pistols." And um, yes. it's all right. Okay. So I went down to the 100 Club and I met Malcolm McLaren there, the manager. And he seemed an interesting guy. I saw the band, there was no one there at the time. The mm. band were there at the end of the club. And uh, I, they were fantastic. It was just so sort of ragged and angry, but the songs are good. Mm. So we. We just got everyone down and we just developed and within a few weeks of their residency down at 100 clubs, the, the whole of the punk movement virtually started in front of my very eyes. It was wow. amazing, actually. It was a phenomenon that just, just happened. Yeah. And they were all dressed in you know, gear and everything. It was great. <laughs> so obviously we signed them to EMI. The Malcolm came with the demos that were pretty vacant and uh, and you know, and those, those other tracks. Yeah. Uh, God Save the Queen. God, yeah. So he was signed. signed. Yeah. It's amazing. It it's amazing great. to think and, that uh, when I when I sort of bought that, uh, never mind the bollocks is a sex business, when I bought that album, never knowing you or anything like yeah. that, knowing, now, knowing you now, that you were the guy yeah. that actually got those on color. It's like, it's amazing to think back like that. It's fantastic, isn't it? And I remember the sort of sex that they were. They it were, was just... Fresh air. It was like, wow, well, this is like so new. It was very exciting. It was very exciting indeed. Unfortunately, as you know, some person within the structure of EMI didn't take to them very kindly after the Bill Grundy interview, which you probably heard mm. about, yes, where yeah. he swore on television. Yes, yeah, yeah well, he didn't do that. that. Well, and um, I didn't fare too well myself afterwards, to tell you the truth. Um, mm. They thought I was rather a, 
a marked character, I think, and they, um, I was demoted. But I managed to keep my job, mm. and I had to claw my way out the greasy pole <laughs> again by signing more acts. No, I wasn't very popular. They were chucked off here, mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a rough. One. So who else? Who, else, anyway, did you, who the, else did you sign those days, Dave? Let's let's let, let the viewers know. What other bands did you sign up? That we, we saw Tom Robinson. Tom Robinson, uh, which did that song Five Four Three Two One. Yeah. Glad to be gay. That we signed uh, ACDC. Oh. Um, yeah, we signed them. Um, we signed Blondie. Um, that was mainly Terry, but I was with him all the way on that one. Mm. We sort of did it together. Um, <clears throat> these were at EMI Publishing. I signed Dex's Midnight Runners, and we did that song, number one hit, Chino. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was pretty cool. Uh, and then the Vapors signed. That was ah. a song that went to number one. Turning, Turning Japanese. Japanese yeah. <laughs> Turning, Turning Japanese. I think so. You know that one. Yeah, yeah. I remember that one. Did that yeah. one. Uh, Paul Young. Paul Young signed. Um, yeah, we, wow. we did, did, did quite a bit. Yeah, that was the publishing side. Uh, mm. and, uh, and then uh, I was asked with Terry, uh, we, was, we went off to work at the EMI Records, took over from uh, the previous regime who'd left the company for mm. another one. Uh, unfortunately, I, the first band I, I bought in was Duran Duran. Wow. Which was very fortunate for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not a bit of luck, really. Yeah. You know? and I had Gold, a, golden a, geese, a Dave. Golden geese. Part. Yeah, one of those. <laughs> one of those, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Wow. I fought for them. I fought for them. I you, yeah, I fought really hard. Yeah. And um, and they were that, 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 that they really what kept me going for several years because they just banging out hit after mm. hit after hit. If, they, if we didn't get a big hit, they generally sorted it out. We get ourselves some, like a Nile Rogers came along when mm. things were looking a little bit flaky, and he did that wonderful remix on Reflex. And oh, he yes. put that uh, scratch. He yeah. put that scratch into the chorus. Re yeah, Re Re Reflex? Which, which was helpful. Yeah, that, yeah it, I was saying, I said, I'm not sure if it's quite a hit as it is. And so, whether they went off and did that and some people didn't like it but i thought it was great anyway yeah. it really happened and that brought the band back and there were some great records we to kill it was another fantastic one and there was the other um the other one uh arcadia you know, did not terrorists you know, yes yeah 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 it That's is a good. fantastic track and um, but that that kept me going for quite well and then Nick Nick Rhodes uh, brought in a band, I think it was called Kajagoogoo, mm. and um, he co-produced that single for me, Too Shy. Yeah. And we signed that. Number wow. one in every country in the world. Yeah, because that was basically, I was, I was in Bedford, so they, those boys were from Leighton Buzzard, <coughs> Kajagoogoo, Lamar and that were from Leighton Oh, Buzzard, yeah. So, yeah, so I was oh. not far away. We were going, oh, a Nick, local band. The... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're great guys. And Nick, Nick, they're actually they were phenomenal musicians. Stuart was Royal College of Music, mm. and Steve, guitarist, is great. And um, Nick Beggs is still out there playing great bass and yeah. doing really good stuff. And uh, then we had a row, and Lamar left, and but we uh, managed to sort him out. We mm. did that. We'll never Nick, end now, Nick Beggs, isn't he? George and Ryan. Nick Biggs, isn't he still, lo is he local to Richmond, isn't he now? I think he lives around here. Yeah, I think, I think does, so. Yeah. Barnes, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think he does. I'm pretty sure I've got him no, on he's, he's, or Facebook or something, yeah. He's, he's a stay. He'll, he'll be playing great stuff forever, mm. that guy, you know. Mm. I, I, I expect he's going to do more. I personally think he's got a lot in him. Yeah. Um, He's got a great sense of humour as well. He's a funny guy. And yeah. uh, I don't know what the other guys did. I really don't know. I don't know what Chris did. That's that's Limal. Mm. He, he should have done better. He had a couple of hits after that himself. Mm. You know, he should have. But he sort of disappeared for a while. I don't know what's happened. Yeah, I remember him doing a couple of solos. Yeah. So, Dave, yeah. what was the... What was the 
what was the sort of like um so you were working for emi doing this and the other the other people around i suppose sony and other people and um whoever else i mean how did you did you sort of like you just managed to get in at the right time and get these people or was there ever a fight between you know and, and a bidding war to try and get a band signed or were you sort of like quite exclusive to what you yeah were doing? no emi at that time was not very strong because after the pistols the credibility of the company had gone down the tubes mm. so in terms of credible relax I mean, I had to fight really hard to get Duran Duran. There was opposition from another company. And, you know, there's a long story of me in the van in the Winnebago. And, the, and you know, I was trying to sign them and, and someone had outbid us. And, I, you know, I thought we'd lost the band, but we we didn't have mobile phones and I had to jump out of the phone box. And I said, for God's sake, we're speaking to we need We need some more money to offer them. Luckily, you know, I had the money wow. and we got the band, thank you. Uh, so it wasn't easy. Uh, we had a, we chased a Spandau Ballet. We wanted them. That was yeah. before Duran. They wanted a huge sum of money, and it was ridiculous. Mm. Something like close line. <laughs> but uh, other bands we visited against Duran was one that was really hard. The uh, Pistols wasn't hard. Most of them were easy mm. actually to get. Um, what about Pet Shop Boys? You know, it's, it, was that a Easy. Pet shop boys were very. It was easy. That was so easy. It was ridiculous, because wow. Tom Watkins. I'd signed a band called Spelt Like This, mm. which unfortunately was one of my biggest disasters. And um, David Munns, who'd just come in as sort of general manager dash MD, he um, he really got into it. And Tom Watkins, the famous manager of Bros and Pet Shop Boys, mm. he was a manager and he really wound the company up. I mean, he made poor months spend nearly half his marketing budget, I think, on this band. <laughs> Goodness knows what and clothes and things. And the record did not take contract with the heart. God dear. That was a yeah. terrible moment for me. Yeah. And I thought it was over. But then uh, then they and they didn't happen. But then these things happen and uh, they came in with a a demo of opportunities and um, Western Girls. Mm. And those have just been released by CBS Records and had done absolute zero. So they were they were a sort of off label. But there's such a thing as in record contracts called uh, there's a re-restriction rights where you can't record that song for a period of years or so. And so. Mm. But business affairs did a great job, and Tom did, and we had that waiver. And CBS let us re-record those songs and own those songs. Wow! So that was like great. So that was really easy, and we made opportunities. That wasn't a big hit, but it's got things going with their their sort of gothic, sort of Manchurian disco sound, mm. which was great. Mm. And then we got Stephen Hagen. We did a magnificent job on Western Girls, and it just flew. It just yeah. went number one everywhere in the world. I remember and, uh, being at the. I remember being at the Hammersmith Palais. We used to go up there almost every week, dancing no. and clubbing and that. And West, whenever Western Girls came on, it was like wow, everyone was up dancing. It was like, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, that was great, and uh, and um, you know. There were a few others, and when I left, I've had a few competitions to get things. Sputniks, I signed Zig Zig Sputnik, uh, F-111, Love Missile. Yeah, yeah. And that was crazy timing, that was crazy. I had competition from Electra Asylum on that one. I thought I'd lost them, because mm. it's just that you have your times, you know, where you have your times in Replicums where you don't have it. And then there's all these people working that promotion and everyone's looking at you and saying, hey, what's happening? You, you know, the big company, they, they, they want hit records every week. You mm. know, it's just like, it's got to be that way to, yeah, to yeah. keep it going. Yeah, and uh, that was a bit tough. But uh, luckily, um, that, that one came through and I got Georgia Moroder to produce oh, that right. yeah and he's a great 
I realise how great he is. He's he really did, great. He did with Phil Oakey, didn't uh, he? Um, Phil Oakey with the Human League. He did. George Emeroda did that one, didn't yeah. he? Oh yeah, yes he did. Yeah, yeah. and he, he did all that Donna Summer stuff in the uh, yeah. Great. He, he sort of invented this kind of way. Mm. We flew him over and, with his programmer, and they just sort of made the record with Sputniks. I think it went to number three or two in the charts. I think, mm. and that was pretty good. And everyone went mad for them for a while. Oh, so, yeah. and, so, Dave, and then so, suddenly everyone were off like, yeah. So I can go on all, forever. All of, oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know when we've met, it's always been like, <laughs> let's go on forever. Um, a few glasses of wine later. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> yeah. With the um, yeah. with the sort of like you're, you're talking about, sort of all these bands and bits and pieces. How many? I mean, did you go out to venues and find venues and find bands in these venues, or was it? Did you do much of that? You know, sitting at the back, yes. and writing the notes. And yeah. Stuff? I tell you something. When I first started at EMI, we had a tiny house in Fulham, which I got from my royalties and all that. And luckily, we had the Greyhound just in Fulham Palace Road. We had the Golden Lion, and we had the National Rooms. Yeah. So I, I had the luxury of going, just going back from work and doing the admin and all that, and being able to suddenly say. Hey, look, I'm just going to pop over to the natural check out a couple of bands. And it was just down the road. And I, mm. well, I saw, I saw you 2 there, which I lost, which really upset me. Mm. Um, I saw 101ers, which were the embryonic part of the Clash, Joe's drummer. Mm -hmm. I lost, you know, I lost a lot of bands, you know. I went to the Clash too. You know, yeah. you can't get them all. And, <laughs> no. um, and what else did I see there? And I saw the jam at oh. the Greyhound. Yeah. yeah. I wow. mean, that was pretty cool, isn't it? To go just, just down the road for a local pub and there, there are these bands there. It was just fantastic. And um, we also, ACDC came over uh, with a tape. No, but you, it was so convenient because they were playing at the Nashville, wow. um, which was a really good place. But it sort of all moved now to North London. Uh, where the place where the most music business goes, which is what's it called now? There was a monarch and the Dublin Castle. Dublin, Dublin Castle. Castle. Yeah, that's yeah. Where, yeah, there's another band that I lost called Coldplay, <laughs> which was really annoyed me. I really bugged <laughs> me because I went to see it. I and love the way you, I, I, the way it, you say I had it today. A, Sorry, I love the way you say like there's another band they're called Coldplay. Like it is like has anyone heard of them? It's like... <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. They said actually true, and because someone <laughs> gave me a tip about it, and I had a deal with Warner's the Sanctuary, had where I worked for, and I said, well, it's great band, and Warner's Publishing. I could have done the deal. I had it, and he wouldn't let me sign them. Yeah. So that's, I tell you, when I, when I meet the guy every time now, he says, don't, Dave, don't say a word. <laughs> play. One of those. I confess, I confess. <laughs> so I look, so, at him, look at him with dagger. <laughs> we could talk all night about your your industry stuff but we want to sort of like we want yeah. to move on now to a little bit about your musical abilities as well as a musician because you're a musician um and yeah. um, and so so should we try and keep this a bit brief <laughs> how can we keep dave ambrose brief well, there's no way of doing that um you're so could you right. a little, do you want to yeah. tell us a little bit like it, or should we should we actually talk about where people can read about your history well it's in the book there's quite a lot shall i show you no let's have a look at the book yeah so we've got we're, we're here to promote yeah. dave's ambrose this book is the well. book um <laughs> yes you, you might as well have this the camera That's this, it, this yeah. is just out in the next few days how to be a, how rock, to be star, a rock star dave ambrose this was inspired this title was inspired by uh the idea of um hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy because I, I never felt I never was a pop star. I was never a pop star, but I was this sort of character in the music business that you know had all these ex extraordinary experiences, and uh, as a musician, and then as a record company guy. 
So it's quite a good book, I promise you. Mm. It's co-written with Leslie Ann Jones, who's just done the John Lennon book, who's also done a book uh, on Freddie Mercury, David Bowie, and T. Rex. So wow. I'm in good company. It's great. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. And I see the foreword is by Mick Fleetwood, who you know quite well. Yes, well, that's... Mick, yeah, that's where we all began. That's where it all began, really, mm. with me and Mick and the Bardens in Notting Hill. Wow. And uh, music, music side. No, it was just music, just always the thing, playing at school, Eddie Cochran, and learning all the shadow stuff on the guitar. And, um, and then living in London, and um, bought a small house in Notting Hill Gate. And, I went to go to the local youth club and I was very nervous, didn't know anyone. And then a band struck up doing the show stuff and something happened. And someone said, look, can anyone play the bass? And I was a guitarist at the shadow stuff. So I knew mm. the stuff. So I got on the bass. And I think it was about 15, 15 and a half, I think. I was just doing my O-levels. And um, that was it. The next thing I was playing with all these amazing people. I started the band. Uh, Peter Barton, or Ray Davis, Hamilton Kings, and then uh, he left to start the Kings. But we made a record with him, which was a great couple, and uh, and just played semi-pro bands, the Bookertis, which I the art school, a lot of debutantes there. So I used to chat up the Debs, <laughs> and we were a very wealthy semi-pro band. We were doing all the Deb dances <laughs> until one of the members who remained nameless ran off with the family sword and was running around the garden here and with a bad reputation on that. <laughs> so that was the end of the book of two, doing the death dances and very lucrative it was too. Yeah. But we're still great friends. Yeah. Uh, and we did, that was my school days and then um, did quite a lot. And, and then I was working in a, as a, in an ad agency as a designer and, Peter Bardens rang me up and said, do you want to, I've just left them, the band with Van Morrison. Mm. I'm forming a band with signed to by me, me and Mick. Do you want to join? Mm. Terrible decision to make. <laughs> but I thought, to hell with it, let's do it. So I did it. And then the crazy world of rock and roll began for me with uh, the Bees and um, it was Peter Green. We all learned to play down the Flamingo All Nighters and we did Ricky Tick. Mm. Then we got a singer in, Beryl and Beryl Marsden and Rod Stewart. And we were sort of did soul stuff, Tamla Motown and soul stuff, which wow. was a single minor hit. And then we were two, we were completely out of order, both very young. I was, only, mm. I was 18. We were all just sort of school. So we were having a great time. Mm. I got some great stories there. But, yeah. uh, and then we broke up and I joined up with Rod with Jeff Beck and we did some stuff with Jeff and then I moved on um, and spent some time working with Cat Stevens and did a massive tours with Cat um, around wow. Europe as a mm. session player, you know, I was playing session, session. Mm. Um, and then got back, decided, didn't know what to do when those, he decided to take a break. Um, could have carried on with him. Um, and then Mick and Greeny came around with Jeremy Spencer and I, I, I accepted to be in the band. And then mm. I did a session with Brian Auger and Julie. And um, for argument's sake, I decided to do that instead, which I regret, obviously. But we did pretty well with Brian Auger and Julie. Mm. And I hit records. Yeah. Or mainly around Europe. Mass did about four years of touring America and everything. And um, wow. um, sounds like a great life. A with, uh, <laughs> I suppose we can look back and say it sounds like a great yeah. life now because of these these people, including yourself, and they're but, so well known. It was hard work, you know. <clears throat> yeah, in those days, of it course, obviously, work. you know, the people like you know, you're talking about Rod Stewart wasn't a well a, a world name and all these people, you know, no, they were world no. names. They were just kids at school and <clears throat> and you know, and I suppose that's why with Basement Door we love we love seeing all these kids at school who potentially have got some mm -hmm. long histories ahead of them that, that may be able to write a book 
later on in their life as well. You never know, do you? <laughs> well, it's, it's nice to say, well, it does happen. It can happen. And I, mm. you know, I, I didn't, my parents, well, let's put it this way, were not approving of what I was doing. So, mm. you know, it was a tough battle. It's a very, very difficult. Thing. Yeah. I think that's the same nowadays, yeah. Dave. I, I hear of sort of like, you know, where parents might be sort of like, well, you've got to get your education and get your A levels and stuff. And I suppose if you're a creative person, that's quite difficult to to do the academia part of your life when you really want to just play music and and write music. You know, that's that's going to be a difficult thing to do, isn't it? Because you're <clears throat> you can't wait, can you? When you're it's, sort of it's, 15, 16, you, you can't, can't wait. wait. <laughs> it's 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 best to. My daughter, she was um, she was offered a, re a record deal because she's uh, and she was just about to go to university, and I just said, "No way, you are going to university, and that's it." And she Thank towed you. the line. Thank goodness she's got a she's got a good degree. And you know, I had I had some manager came off of me a ludicrous sum of money mm. to just to become a pop star when I was about. 17 mm. and my dad just physically threw the manager with his dripping pen and contract 25 grand a year you're and it was a lot of money then mm. i was just God, yeah. so yeah, this does happen you know yeah. and um what i'm i'm saying is it's probably better get your get your degree if you can mm. Yeah. Or get your A levels. At least you can go and you can go into college later because music business is it can be very flippant. And mm. you know, working in a record company, as I said before, you do find that mm. you know you you live from day to day and you're as good as your last hit. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going to yeah. get so the, the book. It's, the it's book, not, it's not book, that easy. <laughs> no, this book sounds really interesting. I haven't got it yet. I'm going to get it because I'm, in the, you know, I'm going to pop around and get you to sign it for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, Great. Um, well, we can have a. We can have a what? Yeah, we'll have it. We'll go. We'll go to that. No, we can we go to uh, to Twicken to that nice place we went to last time. Also. The old yeah. pie, wasn't it? That yeah, was yeah, yeah, yeah. We can go down there. That was yeah. Good. If if they're that's open fine. and not just doing takeaways, if they allow it, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's takeaways, it nice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. Um, yeah, so it's, great. It's, the, the, yeah. The, books, the books available on Amazon now, is it? So you can get it on Amazon. Yes, it is. Yeah, How to you Be can. a Rock Star by Dave Ambrose, forward by Fleetwood. Yeah, Mac. so we'll keep plugging uh, that. with Leslie Ann Jones. Leslie Ann yeah. Jones is co <laughs> That's great. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we'll yeah we'll we'll sort of finish up just before we go, Dave. Um, so I want to thank you very much for being you were you were our um, one of our judges this year for our Battle of the Bands that we do, and it was fantastic yeah, having you on board. Really good, Did great you enjoyed it? Yeah, really good. Okay. Yeah. Well, that um, was yeah, it was a great great night. The last one, and we, and there were some really good bands. Mm. The judges in the end, we we had difficulty deciding who was the best. Very good. Yeah. It's, 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 it's one of the best ones we've had, I think, so far. I mean, we've been building Very this, good. been building this Battle of the Bands over the years. You know, we've had quite a yeah. few of them now, and uh, I think this was well, the, one of the best ones for the amount of bands that we had in, and um, and the sort of talent that was yeah. coming out, and was fantastic. So yeah, so hopefully we'll have a, yeah. hopefully we'll get the finals done because we haven't had the finals yet. So. <laughs> oh yes, the finals Which are coming. Really yeah, sad. so you have to be involved <laughs> right. in that. Yeah. Um I think oh, last, great. last I year we had um, yeah. Steve Tennant who's Duran Duran's ex manager. He was one of the judges. So maybe we'll get you two together to judge as well. <laughs> Which would be okay. Good. All right. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. All right. Um and we never know if Mick if Mick's available to come over, he might be able to come and judge as well because our obviously our theme theme was uh Fleetwood Mac this year. So it was quite poignant that you were involved in it as well. So yeah. Uh, he might he might yeah. do he's stuck in hawaii he lives yeah, in hawaii. yeah stuck in hawaii that's the word to use isn't it stuck in hawaii yeah yeah he is stuck <laughs> he is literally it, stuck as I... <laughs> yes it's really horrible I'm... it's terrible yeah what an awful place to be yeah. in lockdown <laughs> yeah 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 Cool. Listen, Dave, it's yeah. been great talking to you, and thank you so much. And we will we will advertise your book and everything. And I can't wait to read it and get stuck into it because you've got a, a, such an amazing 
um, history um, in the in the music industry. So it's going to be really great to read it. And thank you so much for doing this interview with us. Um, <coughs> and um, I hope to see you soon. So um, yeah, um, any yeah, we'll, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and have you got any parting words for our musicians that are listening to our bands? You want to sort of like. Well, stay alert and definitely um, be very, very wary of the business side. I do advise you to to know a little bit about the music business and how it works, because it's a very complicated business um, and lawyers are expensive. Mm. And um, but, you know, you can do quite a lot yourself. And if you've got the passion, you'll make it. Good. Yeah. Lovely. That's my. Thank you very much, okay. Dave Ambrose. Cheers. Cheers.